And now we begin the life of Naratam Das Thakur. Naratam Das Thakur was the embodiment of Gaudiya teachings. He conveyed love of God through his memorable poetry and lived that love in the same poetic way. He was the perfect devotee, the archetypal messenger of the divine, whose characteristics the six Goswamis described every time their quill touched palm leaf. More than Srinivas or Shyamananda, Naratam is remembered as the superlative Gaudiya, perhaps because the ultimate philosophical conceptions of Gaudiya Vaishnavism are reflected in every one of his songs. Consequently, Naratam's achievements have been fully recognized by historians and surveyors of the Gaudiya tradition. It is not possible to accurately describe Naratam's merit, but noted Bengali historian Ramakanta Chakravarti has nicely summarized his major accomplishments in his classic work on Bengali culture. Quote, the importance of Naratam Datta in the history of the post-Chaitanya Vaishnav movement in Bengal can hardly be overestimated. He worked in unison with Srinivas Acharya for the establishment of the Vrindavan doctrine in Bengal. He was one of the principal organizers of the Keturi festival in which the Vrindavan viewpoint finally dominated over the other views. Naratam Datta and his disciples boldly flouted caste. Naratam was an eminent Shudra guru of many Brahmins. He and his disciples spread Vaishnavism in Murshidabad and Rajshoi. Naratam was also the author of several works in which his spiritual ideals were clearly stated. So great was his authority that even the deviant Sahajas found it expedient to write some of their sectarian works in his name. Unquote. Two important events connected with Naratam Das Thakur precipitate his advent. The first is the appearance of Lokanath Goswami in this world, and the second is the prediction by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu of Naratam's birth. A survey of Naratam's life would be incomplete without a thorough analysis of these two episodes. Lokanath Goswami was the son of Padmanabha Chakravarti and Sita Devi, and was born in a small village known as Talakadi in East Bengal's Jessore district. According to some sources, he was Mahaprabhu's schoolmate in Navadvip. When Lokanath was very young, perhaps in his teenage years, Mahaprabhu sent him to Vrindavan along with Bugarba Goswami to rediscover the lost pilgrimage sites of Krishna's pastimes. This was an important project. Due to the passage of time and the invasion of foreign powers, many shrines in the Vrindavan area had become obscured. Mahaprabhu's desire to reclaim those lost sites did not begin when he sent Rupa and Sanatan to that most sacred of holy places because he had sent Lokanath much earlier. Mahaprabhu sent him with Bugarba because in his omniscience Mahaprabhu knew that Lokanath and Bugarba were the best of friends both in this life and in Krishna's eternal Leela. Moreover, their identity in Krishna Leela enabled them to recognize the exact location of many of the lost places of pilgrimage. According to Goda Ganodesha Deepika, Lokanath and Bugarba were, in their previous births, Leela Manjari and Prima Manjari respectively. And sometimes it is said that they were Manjulali Manjari and Nandimuki. It is said that they arrived in Vrindavan in 1509 or thereabouts and remained there for the rest of their lives. Lokanath Goswami's major accomplishments in Vrindavan include constructing the Gokulananda Temple, today one of the seven primary temples of Vrindavan, establishing his deity of Radha Vinod, 
and eventually initiating Narottam Das Thakur. Actually, when Mahaprabhu sent Lokanath to Vrindavan, he warned him that the day would come when Narottam would arrive, and at that time, Lokanath was to initiate Narottam into the Gaudiya tradition. This was the will of Sri Chaitanya. Despite the legend that Lokanath never left Vrindavan, there is one well-documented instance in which he ventured out in search of Mahaprabhu. It was about a year or so after he had first arrived. Having heard that Mahaprabhu had taken sannyas, Lokanath became overwhelmed by the same confusion that had engulfed Srinivas's father, Chaitanya Das, and he immediately left to see Mahaprabhu in his newly adopted order of renunciation. Leaving for Puri, he traveled the long, arduous trails through the Jarakanda forest. After many weeks, he finally arrived, only to find that Mahaprabhu had departed for South India. Lokanath then started south, and for many months he tried to retrace the Lord's steps. After some time, he heard that Mahaprabhu had returned to Puri. Following his master, Lokanath also left for Puri, and this time, he thought, he would definitely meet Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. On his way to Puri, however, he heard that Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was now in Vrindavan. In this way, Lokanath returned to Vrindavan. But when he arrived, he was told that Mahaprabhu had just left, going to Prayag and Benares on his way back to Puri. <laughs> Lokanath was relentless, but Mahaprabhu appeared to him in a dream and told him that he should not waste his time. He should stay in Vrindavan, said Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, for it would torment him to see his Lord in the severe persona of a renunciant. Feeling compassion for his devoted Lokanath, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu asked him to take solace in the memory of their inner relationship and to meditate on him as he appeared in his pre-sannyasi days at Navadvip. Soon after this dream, Lokanath Goswami became even more determined to begin the work of reclaiming the holy places. This he did, but little was accomplished until the arrival of Rupa and Sanatan. In retrospect, it seems that his main role in Vrindavan was as a senior Vaishnav, giving guidance to younger devotees. Moreover, Lokanath Goswami prepared for the arrival of Narottam Das Thakur, who would eventually accept him as Guru. When Chaitanya Mahaprabhu decided to go from Puri to Vrindavan, he stopped in the village of Ramakili to see Rupa and Sanatan. At that time, Mahaprabhu looked into the deep blue waters of the Padma River, facing Keturi village in East Bengal, and began to feverishly shout, O Naratam! O Naratam! This was no surprise to Nityananda Prabhu, the Lord's constant associate. Mahaprabhu had on several occasions already exclaimed this name in the midst of exuberant kirtan. From this, the intimate devotees knew that a great personality would soon take birth, for Naratam literally means the topmost person. On this occasion, however, Mahaprabhu was howling the name of Naratam with an overwhelming sense of joy. Tears flowed from his eyes with uncontrollable force as he ran back and forth like a madman. Nityananda Prabhu was concerned about Mahaprabhu's well-being. He had never seen his master reach this level of irrepressibility, nor had he ever seen him shed tears of love with such vehemence, nearly forcing himself to lose consciousness. Mahaprabhu revealed the reason for his heightened ecstasy. He said, Nityananda, across the Padma in Keturigram, Naratam will soon take birth. This will occur in our lifetime. Kirtan is my life and soul, and Naratam will sustain it. There in Keturi, or Garer Hatta, he will absorb my Kirtan Ras with all of my love. 
I grow anxious for this to occur. For now I will deposit my intense love in the Padma, and when Naratam comes and bathes here, the Padma will extend my love to him. The next morning, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Lord Nityananda Prabhu, and the assembled devotees engaged in an ecstatic kirtan. Nityananda forewarned all of the devotees that Mahaprabhu would be placing his love in the Padma, and that this love would one day be seized by an important devotee named Nartam. After the kirtan, the devotees went to bathe, and when Mahaprabhu entered the Padma, all the waters began to overflow, unable to contain the divine prema that Mahaprabhu had stored there. At that time, the personified Padma is said to have appeared to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and the devotees. She asked the Lord, I understand that you want me to deliver this love to Naratam, but how will I know when he comes? How will I be able to identify him? Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu answered, When someone enters your waters and causes you to overflow, as I have just done, and when a person comes whose presence makes you greatly jubilant, that is Naratam. The Padma Vatij smiled, offered her obeisances, and returned to her watery form. Nityananda Prabhu was taken by the beauty of this scene near the Padma River, and expressed to Mahaprabhu that he would like to stay there. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu told him that he would one day return, for it was his duty to bring Naratam at the appropriate time to the Padma. Nityananda Prabhu is the personification of Guru Tattva, and so he would naturally guide Naratam to the river where the divine treasure of love of God was waiting. In or around the year of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's disappearance, 1534, on a full moon day in the month of Magh, around January to February, Naradham Das appeared in this world. As Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had predicted, he was born in Keturi, the Garer Hatta subdivision, which is about 72 miles northwest of present Rampur Vojalajar in the Rajashoi district of East Bengal, now Bangladesh. His father was a great king named Krishnananda Datta, and his mother's name was Narayani Devi. They were fabulously wealthy and were kayastas by caste. They raised their son as an honored prince. During the traditional Anna Prashanam ceremony for the newly born Naratam, when a baby is supposed to eat his first grains, Naratam's parents were taken aback. It seems that Naratam would not eat, turning his head away from the food in disgust. However, shortly thereafter, when a devout Vaishnav came with similar food that had been offered to Krishna, Naratam ate heartily. All who were present could understand that the only reason he had initially rejected the grains was because the grains were unoffered. This spoke highly of the baby's devotional demeanor. His parents rejoiced. As Naratam advanced in years, he became an exemplary student, mastering all academic subjects and religious books as well. His favorite activity, though, was to sit at the feet of an elderly Brahmin named Sri Krishnadas, who would daily recite the early, middle, and final pastimes of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Naratam relished these stories throughout his youth and resolved to devote his life to the eternal principles of Gaudiya Vaishnavism. One day, soon after Naratam became a teenager, Nityananda Prabhu appeared to him in a dream, saying, Tomorrow, as the sun begins to rise, you should take your bath in the Padma River. At that time, you shall receive the totality of Gaur Prem, or love of God. When Naratam awoke, he immediately complied with Nityananda Prabhu's instruction. Entering the Padma, Naratam felt himself undergo a vital transformation. Just then, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared before his eyes and affectionately embraced him. As their bodies merged, 
he felt Mahaprabhu's very essence engulf his soul. It is said that at that moment, Naratam's naturally dark complexion turned to molten gold, Mahaprabhu's own distinctive hue. Today, pilgrims visit Prematali Ghat in Bangladesh, where this historic event transpired. When Naratam did not return home after some time, his parents sent a search party after him. They found him dancing furiously on the banks of the Padma. Who was this madman? Certainly it was not the same Naru. When they brought him home, his parents did not recognize him. Not only was there a change in the color of his skin, but he now bawled like a lovesick adolescent. This was not some ordinary crying, but the tears of a lover of God. Naratam's parents sensed that it was something to this effect. His mother confronted him directly. My dear Naru, what has happened to you? Why do you weep in this pathetic way? How can I help you? Naratam replied, Dear mother, this morning, when I went to bathe in the Padma, a golden-colored divinity, the Supreme Lord, entered into my heart. It is He who is causing these tears. I am feeling His ardent love, and I am separated from Him. If you want to relieve my distress, allow me to leave home and to go in search of His lotus feet. Then, having expressed his inner heart, Naratam went to the palace Kirtan Hall and started chanting the Lord's names with great ecstasy. All glories to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the Lord of my life. After singing for many hours, he fainted. Krishnananda, Naratam's father, feared that his Naru would run away to adopt the life of renunciation. For a king, this would be a terrible fate, his only son, the heir to the throne, leaving as though all his riches were worthless. Krishnananda also had plans for Naratam's marriage. A renounced life was not what he had in mind for his young Naru. In pursuance of his plans, Raj Krishnananda had his best guards watch Naratam from morning until evening. Ironically, out of love, he made Naratam a prisoner in his own home. Still, Naratam's singular activity, day and night, was reciting the names of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Radha and Krishna. After some time, Krishnananda became desperate and called a spirit tamer to save his possessed child. The spirit tamer said that the boy was suffering from a common wind disorder, that his body should be rubbed with oil, and that a fox should be brought in for the boy to eat. Naratam laughed at this silliness and explained that the killing of animals is forbidden and would in fact only worsen his condition. Naratam's father relented, but this was the sort of embarrassment that young Naratam had to tolerate. Day and night Naratam would pray, Please, my lord, Goranga Mahaprabhu, liberate me from this insane life of family attachment and allow me to serve you in the association of advanced Vaishnavas. This single-minded determination grew so intense that it kept him from sleeping. His mind and heart were completely absorbed in the Lord's pastimes and mission. One night Naratam managed to fall asleep and Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared to him in a dream. After tightly embracing Naratam, as he had done that fateful morning at the Padma River, the Lord said, O Naratam, as you are anxious to be with me, I too have become overwhelmed by your intense devotion, and I am anxious to be with you. For now, though, I want you to go to Vrindavan, and there you should take initiation from my dear associate, Lokanath Goswami.
When Narottam awakened, he was gripped by love and separation more thoroughly than before. Night after night he would try to sleep, but the Lord would allow him to actually rest only sporadically every few nights. When Narottam did sleep, the Lord and his associates would show him special mercy during his dreams by allowing him to enter into the spiritual world and the divine Leela in which he plays a crucial role. Some months elapsed, and Narottam's reputation as a divinely inspired youth spread to all corners of Bengal. When he was sixteen, the Jai Girdar, an influential Muslim governor in the district, requested his presence, wanting to be blessed by the young Narottam. Krishnananda could not refuse a political leader of the Jai Girdar's stature, but he was skeptical. If he gave Narottam the slightest chance, he knew, the young enthusiast would run off to Vrindavan. Still, Krishnananda felt as if he had no choice. Upon reaching the court of Jagidar, Narottam found an opportunity to escape. It was now or never. Moving stealthily and furtively past the guards, he managed to run to the forest, determined to find his way to the holy land of Vrindavan. Although Navadvip was comparatively near, he went in the direction of Vraja, not only because Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had ordered him to do so, but because nearby Navadvip would be the first place that the guards, if sent after him, would look. Going to Vrindavan entailed a lengthy sojourn across much of India on foot. Being the son of a king, his delicate and pampered body could barely endure the hardship of the journey, and he began to experience fatigue and hunger. After three days, his soft feet began to blister, and at one point, due to exhaustion, he lost consciousness. While Narottam was in that exhausted state, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared to him in the form of a golden-skinned Brahmin and supplied a pot of milk for him to drink. Not recognizing the Brahmin as Sri Chaitanya himself, Narottam merely fell asleep, submitting once again to exhaustion. As he slept, Rupa and Sanatan encouraged him in a dream. Narottam, soon your suffering will end. Mahaprabhu has appeared to you and has brought milk for your nourishment. Drink deep and proceed to Vrindavan. With the words of Rupa and Sanatan still resounding in his heart, he awakened and began to weep joyously. In the eternal Leela of Krishna, distributing milk to Sri Radha and the intimate gopis is one of Narottam's services as a Manjari. But now Krishna, in the form of Mahaprabhu, was reciprocating by serving milk to his pure devotee. Contemplating the implications of this loving exchange was all the nourishment that Narottam required, and with renewed vigor he soon continued his journey to Vraja. Before leaving the area in which he had been given the milk by Sri Chaitanya, he was discovered by the family guards. Apparently, Krishnananda had sent many men to scout for Narottam and bring him back. One particular party of competent employees actually found the young runaway. When they questioned him about his resolve, he simply said that he was being faithful like a good wife. He replied, When the husband dies, it is our custom that the faithful wife may follow him into the fire and burn with his body on the funeral pyre. So I too am going into the fire of dedication to God. To extend the analogy, Narottam continued, when a woman wants to show devotion to her husband in this extreme way, it is natural that well-wishers will try to stop her. They will not allow her to enter the fire. So I understand that you do not want me to enter the fire of God consciousness, Narottam concluded, but you should also understand that I would be less than a faithful servant of my Lord if I did not attempt to enter that fire. 
Naratam's simple and poetic analogy so moved the guards that they let him go on his way. One guard even gave him some money for his expenses. This was a common example of Naratam's spiritual potency and divinely bewitching personality. After this incident, he approached Mathura near Lord Krishna's birthplace and bathed in the Yamuna at Vishram Ghat. That night, he met an elderly Brahmin who invited him to stay at his home. This Brahmin informed Naratam that Sanatan, Rupa, Raghunath Bhatta, Kashishvar Pandit, and others had recently departed from this world to rejoin Mahaprabhu's Leela in the kingdom of God. As the Brahmin spoke, Naratam began to cry. He had traveled many miles and had hoped to personally meet all of these exalted personalities. Contemplating the untimely demise of the teachers he had idolized, he fainted. The biographies concur, however, that at that time, all of the exalted souls whom Naratam had wanted to see appeared to him in a spiritual vision. In fact, the fortunate Brahmin at whose house Naratam was staying was able to hear much of the discussion that Naratam had with these departed souls. Rupa and Sanatan especially consoled Naratam, encouraging him to seek out Jiva Goswami to study Gaudiya philosophy. <laughs> When Naratam finally arrived in Vrindavan, he came upon the Govinda Dev Mandir. Seeing Rupa Goswami's magnificent temple structure drove him mad, and his body exhibited eight symptoms of ecstasy, such as intense weeping, horripilation, and change in color. Naturally, Jiva Goswami was quickly informed of this new sadhu's arrival and could understand that he was the long-awaited Naratam. Sri Jiva hurriedly walked to the Govinda Dev temple, and when he saw Naratam, he was immediately reminded of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Just then, many great Vaishnav Mahants arrived, asking, Where is Naratam? Where is Naratam? And with great love, all of the devotees pointed to the young saint who was sprawled across the temple courtyard in a trance like state. This indeed is young Naratam. As Naratam met Vrindavan's most advanced devotees, he was particularly impressed by Lokanath Goswami, whose exceptional sense of humility and austerity was noted by all Vaishnavs. Lokanath was very kind to Naratam and arranged for a portion of the temple's sacred vegetarian food offering, or prasadam, for him to eat. Since Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had revealed to Lokanath the night before in a dream, that Naratam would arrive the next day, Lokanath had made preparations so they could eat together. And during that meal, Naratam told Lokanath his entire story. After relating the major incidents of his life, he concluded by saying, Actually, I have no right to sit with you and take this pure food. I do not even have a guru. Hearing this, Lokanath Goswami laughed heartily, reminding him, you have received the direct grace of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He is the original Guru, the Guru of the universe. Besides Him, who else do you want for a teacher? He has given you divine love, the same love that most devotees hanker for throughout their entire lifetime. You possess that love. What is the value of having another Guru? Naratam replied, My Prabhu, I am a poor man bereft of all good qualities. Your order is my life and soul. But if you will permit me, I would like to say a few more words on this subject. Lokanath then assured him that he could speak freely. It is true that Mahaprabhu is the only real guru, Naratam agreed, but he simultaneously has faith in you to be my guru and has asked me to take initiation from you. The guru guides his disciple in practical spiritual life. I have no spiritual insight, and I am feeling separation from the Lord. For this reason, I beg for your mercy. Lokanath laughed at his future disciple's insistence. He countered Naratam by saying, The scriptures recommend that the prospective disciple chant the holy names of Krishna 
in a regulated way for at least a year and develop an attachment for the holy name within his heart. Lokanath, out of humility, had vowed never to accept any disciples. And particularly now that Sanatan and Rupa had passed away, he was grieving their loss. So Naratam was clearly given a rough time of it. Nonetheless, chanting was not foreign activity to Naratam, and so complying with Lokanath Goswami's orders, he chanted Japa for a full year in Vrindavan. During this time, Naratam listened to Lokanath's discourses on a regular basis. Out of humility, he ate only the remnants of Lokanath's food, and then he cleaned the area and performed various menial services. A year passed in this way, and Lokanath was still disinclined to give initiation to his worthy disciple. Naratam was totally devoted to Lokanath, and he used to arrive secretly every day near Lokanath's dwelling late at night to clean the area where Lokanath had evacuated. Once Lokanath hid in the bushes and discovered that it was Naratam who was cleaning up after him. Nonetheless, Lokanath remained true to his vow and did not initiate Naratam. After another year of Naratam's selfless service, Lokanath had a sacred dream. Mahaprabhu appeared to Lokanath and chastised him for not initiating Naratam. Did I not tell you to initiate him? Mahaprabhu insisted, do not continue in this false humility. Lokanath now knew that he had to initiate Naratam. Soon after this incident, Naratam again approached Lokanath for initiation. This time, Naratam offered a very pleasing argument. I am like a young woman who has already chosen her husband, Naratam said. My heart is clear without any doubt. A young woman who makes up her mind in this way prays that her father will agree with her choice. I pray that our Father in heaven agrees with my choice. Lokanath was moved by Naratam's sincerity and said, Your fierce determination has exceeded my own but you are the only disciple I will ever make. For the remainder of his life, he adhered to this vow. Lokanath initiated Naratam according to the guidelines of the Gaudiya Sampradaya, giving him the confidential Radha Krishna Mantra and the Gayatri Mantra as well. In addition, Lokanath revealed Naratam's ontological Manjari form as Vilas Manjari, or as he is sometimes called, Champak Manjari, and explained his service in the spiritual world. Generally, the Guru does not reveal such esoteric subjects so early in the disciple's devotional life. But Naratam was clearly an exception in every way. Lokanath concluded the initiation by asking Naratam to take shelter of Jiva Goswami for further instruction. As the days passed into weeks and then months, Naratam grew in spiritual accomplishment, as did his reputation throughout Vrindavan. One night a divine Vaishnavi appeared to him in a dream and said, Dedicate yourself to the feet of your guru and do whatever he asks. Your sincerity and austerity have pleased me, and I will see that you are engaged in a very confidential service. When I meet Krishna every afternoon in the Kunja, I see that the Sakis are serving him with the utmost care. They make a special milk-based preparation for him, and Champakalata is the most efficient gopi in this service. You shall work under her direction, boiling the milk, and remember that I become happy if Krishna is happy. When Naratam awoke, he quickly ran to Lokanath Goswami's hut, and conveyed the entire dream. Lokanath embraced Naratam, confirming that the Vaishnavi was indeed Radhika, Krishna's consort. Lokanath was pleased to hear that Naratam was given a special service, boiling milk,
by Radharani herself. Lokanath understood that this was his disciple's eternal service to Krishna, and that Radhika was merely reinstating him in that service. After being given this unique chore by Radharani, and having it confirmed by his guru, Naratam would sometimes go into elaborate meditative trances, visualizing himself boiling milk for Radhika and the gopis while in his Manjari form. Often in this visualized Siddha Deha, or perfected form, he found it useful to use dry wood for the fire, which kept the milk boiling. On occasion, however, the milk would overflow. Whenever this happened, Naratam would try to stop the overflowing milk with his bare hands. During his intense meditations, he would often neglect the fact that his hands were scorched. But when his reverie subsided, he saw that the scorched hands in his mystical vision had accompanied him back to the world of three dimensions. Sometimes he tried to cover his marked hands with a piece of cloth, but all of Vrindavan knew the transcendent way in which he had received the burns. Complying with the order of Lokanath, Naratam submitted himself at the feet of Sri Jiva Goswami, asking the Goswami to accept him as a student. In response, Jiva Goswami took hold of his hands and immediately requested him to tell the story of how they became so badly burned. Naratam then told his master the recurring events of his inner meditation. As Sri Jiva listened, he felt great satisfaction and spiritual ecstasy. He confirmed that Naratam was indeed Vilas Manjari, and Naratam said, Yes, Radhika herself has addressed me in this way. Hearing this with boundless glee, Jiva Goswami embraced Naratam, saying, You are the manifestation of Mahaprabhu's love, and with this love you will flood the entire universe. It was during this period that Naratam met Srinivas, who came to Vrindavan to study under Sri Jiva, and the two of them became dear friends. They were known as Jiva Goswami's best students, and along with Duki Krishnadas, Shamananda, they excelled in all of their studies. Consequently, Jiva Goswami bestowed distinguished titles upon them, Naratam Das Thakur Mahashoy, Srinivas Acharya Prabhu, and Shamananda, and he gave them the special mission of distributing the Bhakti Ras scriptures throughout Greater Bengal and Orissa. When the Bhakti Ras scriptures were stolen by King Birambir, Srinivas resolved to get them back, and so he stayed in Vana Vishnupur, as mentioned in the previous chapter. At that time, however, Srinivas sent Naratam back home to Keturi in East Bengal with Shamananda who would accompany Naratam for some time and then proceed to his native town in Orissa. At first, Naratam and Shamananda traveled rather aimlessly, intoxicated with divine love, but heartbroken by the disappearance of the bhakti literature. As they walked from town to town, Naratam, being senior, instructed Shamananda in the devotional books of Gaudiya Vaishnavism. He had been studying under Sri Jiva for a longer period and Shamananda relished hearing his explanations. In this way they passed many days and nights together. Eventually they made their way to Keturi in East Bengal, where they contacted Naratam's relatives. When Naratam's long-lost family members saw him with his saintly friend, these pious people immediately fell to the ground with tears of joy, realizing for the first time just how much they had felt Naratam's separation. Their Naru had returned. He was happy to see everyone as well. He told them all about his stay in Vrindavan, and they were in awe as he explained the secrets of the Goswami's bhakti literature. After ten days, according to plan, Shamananda Pandit left for Orissa 
and Naratam provided him with the necessary travel funds. Words cannot express the sadness that the two saints must have experienced as they left each other's side, though the Bengali biographies do their best to convey the pathos. Months passed, and during this period Naratam often kept to himself, chanting Radha Krishna mantra and meditating on his eternal service according to the techniques of Raganuga Bhajan. By this time, Naratam had begun to initiate disciples. Some of the most important writers, poets, and devotees of India came to him for shelter. Among those first disciples are his cousin Santosh Datta, Sri Devi Das, Sri Goranga, Sri Gokul, Ganga Narayan Chakravarti, Raj Narasingha, Queen Rupamala, Raj Chand Roy, Santosh Roy, and many others. Premavilas lists 123 disciples. Under Naratam's direction, they were able to break open the storehouse of love of Godhead and distribute every drop of nectar to the thirsty inhabitants of Ketorigram and its neighboring villages. Longing to travel to the holy places directly associated with Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's pastimes, as Srinivas had done some years earlier, Naratam now explored all of Gormandala with great relish. He visited all of the surviving associates and the second-generation devotees as well, embracing the company of Shuklambar Brahmachari, for example, and in the ruins of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's house, he spent time with Ishan Thakur as well. Naratam visited Damodar Pandit, and he met Srivas Thakur's two brothers, Sripati and Sri Nidhi. He also associated with Achyutananda, Advaita Acharya's son, Ridoy Chaitanya, Shamananda's guru, Abhiram Thakur, Janavadevi, and Bir Bhadra, her son, and others. Naratam was also fortunate enough to meet Narahari Sarkar and Raghunandana Thakur. When Naratam came into the presence of these special souls, he fell into fits of ecstasy, crying, shouting, laughing, muttering as if in a stupor, and even fainting. He thus happily interacted with these saintly persons and saw such divine camaraderie as an extremely significant and thrilling part of his spiritual development. Engulfed in the mood of association, he went to Puri and visited Gopinath Acharya, Gopal Guru Goswami, and others. And since they were direct witnesses, he asked them penetrating questions about the final Leela of the Lord. He then traveled to Jajagram and was temporarily reunited with Srinivas Acharya. After some time, he visited Katwa, where the Lord had entered the renounced order of life and finally he arrived at Ekachakra, the place where Nityananda Prabhu had first appeared in this world. Some of Naratam's biographers, such as Narahari Chakravarti in his Bhakti Ratnakar, for example, stress the, stress the importance of this pilgrimage, especially his visit to Nityananda Prabhu's birthplace. As stated in the Prima Vilas, Naratam was an incarnation of Nityananda Prabhu's ecstasy, and so his visit to the Lila Stali of that divine soul was viewed as a most significant mystical occurrence. After visiting many of the holy places and personalities of Chaitanya Lila, Naratam returned to Keturi. When he arrived, a letter was waiting for him. It was from his Diksha Guru, Lokanath Goswami. In the letter, Lokanath asked him to establish deity worship in Keturigram, because although there were many sincere devotees at Keturi, according to Lokanath, they would develop best with the Archa Vigraha to worship on a daily basis. This would be a significant step in the spiritual lives of Naratam's disciples. He chose the day of Gorpurnima 
the auspicious birth anniversary of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to inaugurate a huge installation festival. This festival would also offer Naratam an opportunity to spread the teachings of the Goswamis throughout the Bengal area, for all important Vaishnavas would attend a celebration in honor of Mahaprabhu's appearance. The Lord had completed His manifest pastimes several decades earlier, but His birth anniversary had not been observed as a big Mahotsava, or great celebration. This would be the first time, and so Naratam invited many important Vaishnav Mahants, great souls from throughout the Indian subcontinent, particularly in Bengal and Orissa. Although there is tremendous scholarly debate over the exact year of this festival, it can safely be said that it occurred between the 6th and 8th decade of the 16th century. Hundreds of the first and second generation associates of Mahaprabhu and their followers received invitations written in elaborate Sanskrit poetry. Still, Naratam wondered how he would properly accommodate these noteworthy souls, for out of deep respect he wanted to offer them the best possible facilities. As it transpired, Naratam would indeed be able to give his guests such first-rate lodgment, since Raj Krishnananda, Naratam's father, and Raj Purushottam, Naratam's uncle, had both passed away, leaving the riches of the kingdom to Santosh Dutta, Naratam's very close cousin. Santosh had recently become Naratam's disciple and was anxious to meet Naratam's peers and other exalted devotees. Consequently, Santosh became the prime mover behind the organization of the festival, and under Naratam's order he willingly bore the entire expense. Laboring for many months, a huge and ornate temple was constructed, with a large storehouse for food, an elaborately designed kirtan hall, an adjoining residential building for devotees, an idyllic bathing pond, a colorful and highly wrought flower garden, and another guest house for additional visitors. Messengers were dispatched in all directions to invite not only Vaishnavs, but also kings, landowners, poets, scholars, authors, performers, and other illustrious guests. The devotees of Jajagram came together with Srinivasacharya and Govinda Kaviraj. Ramachandra came as well, providing the opportunity for his friendship with Naratam to blossom. From Nar Singapore in Orissa came Shamananda Pundit and his followers, including Rasik Morari. Janabama and her entire entourage came from Kardaha. From the Srikanda district came Raghunandana Thakur and many other devotees. Srivas Thakur's brothers came from Navadvip, and Advaita Acharya's sons came from Shantipur. Ridoy Chaitanya traveled from Ambika Kalna, as did many other Gaudiya Mahants. This is just a brief sampling of the devotees who attended. Since all of these exalted souls traveled from their respective towns, largely by walking, they gathered new followers along the way telling everyone they met about the fabulous festival that would soon take place at Keturi. Hundreds snowballed into thousands, and over the course of one week, they all reached the borders of West Bengal. Santosh Dutta arranged for dozens of colossal boats to ferry back and forth as devotees needed to cross the river. Once the devotees were in East Bengal, luxurious palanquins and huge ox carts carried them to Keturi Gram. The hosts, Naratam, Srinivas, and Santosh Dutta, greeted everyone as they arrived. 
offering each guest a flower garland and welcoming them with great affection. All the devotees were given separate accommodations with personal servants to tend to their needs. The guest of honor, Janavama, Acharyani, was the senior and most respected Vaishnav at the event, and so Naratam specifically worshipped her with flowers and chandan, and encouraged the devotees to do the same. Actually, the role of Janavama at the Ketori festival should be properly highlighted. Within the Gaudiya Sampradaya, diverse philosophical conceptions were coming to the fore, such as Gaur Nagari Bhav, Rasa Raj, Gaur Paramyavad, the teaching that Mahaprabhu is the ultimate Godhead, Nittai Paramyavad, Advaita Paramyavad, and other variations as well. Each of these conceptions embody distinct nuances too complex to illuminate in this short book. Janava, as the leading Vaishnava of the time, mediated on behalf of all these camps and resolved their differences to the satisfaction of the Gaudiya orthodoxy. Thus her presence was especially appreciated by Naratam Thakur. After worshipping Janava Devi in the appropriate way and showing proper respect to all the assembled Vaishnavas, Raghunandana Thakur sang the invocation prayers, signifying an extremely holy event. A huge kirtan ensued well into the night as a preparation for the actual festival, which began on the following day. The next morning, thousands of enthusiastic devotees began the celebration of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Appearance Day festival with a huge, enthusiastic kirtan. Then Naratam unveiled five sets of Radha Krishna deities, whose names were Balabhi Kanta, Sri Krishna, Vraja Mohan, Radha Kanta, and Radha Raman, and also two gorgeous deities of Sri Chaitanya and his consort all to be installed with the blessings of the assembled Vaishnavas. The purpose of such deity worship centers around the Vaishnav belief, grounded in the scriptures, that Krishna agrees to accept service through his properly installed Archa Vigraha, and that the devotees can thus develop a personal conception by focusing their mind and senses on God in a plainly visible form. Srinivas Acharya presided over the Abhishek ceremony, or the traditional bathing of the deities. Meanwhile, experienced orators and the Kirtaniyas glorified Krishna according to elaborate Vaishnav traditions. Without cessation, intricate classical dances and various dramatic performances were enacted, as the whole of Keturi roared with the holy name of Lord Krishna. After the deities were installed according to the strictures of Smriti Shastra, the edible offerings as well as the flower garlands were given to Janava, who then gave Srinivas, Naratam, Shamananda, and Santosh Datta her direct remnants. Then the rest of the devotees feasted and discussed Krishna for many hours. Finally, the devotees went into the large ornate kirtan hall, where Naratam began to lead a moving, deliberate kirtan in his own distinct style. This came to be known as the Garanhati form of kirtan, with its mellow, unmistakable melodies and its rich emotional content. It was based on the classical Drupada technique, which is serene and majestic. Naratam Das Thakur employed the most sophisticated rhythms, or tala, melodic formats, or raga, gestures of emotional expression, or abhinaya, and developed dance techniques, natyam, in his kirtan at Ketori. This is elaborately described in Bhakti Ratnakar. Sri Goranga Das, Sri Gokul Das, and Sri Balaba Das were at his side with a large number of musicians led by Devi Das, an expert Murdunga player. After the musicians had reached a crescendo, 
Narottam appeared on the stage and began to sing. Everyone followed along by playing instruments, singing, and dancing, and all wept when they heard the recondite voice of Narottam Thakur, leading them through the chanting of the beautiful mantras. It is described that Narottam and the countless waves of the devotees looked like the full moon and the numberless stars in the sky. Also significant is the fact that Narottam was inaugurating what came to be known as Padavali Kirtan, a dramatic singing technique that begins with the Gaur Chandrika, or glorification of Mahaprabhu, and then gradually evolves to Radha Krishna Kirtan in a very beautiful way, often connected through thematic references and melodic consistency. It is said that this method was originally inspired, at least in seed-like form, by the melodious voice of Swarup Damodar, the Lord's intimate associate, but was not systematized at that time. It was developed further by the three Ghosh brothers, Madhava, one of the greatest Madanga players of all time, Govinda, known as a preeminent Pujari, and Vasu, who was a fabulous singer and wrote many Gaur Chandrikas. But now it was brought to new heights by Narottam at the Ketori festival. It is said that Narottam's kirtan, more than anybody else's, had reached a perfected state. This is accepted by Gaudiya Vaishnavas as an objective fact for a number of reasons, not least of which may be the miraculous occurrence that has been documented by all biographers of that period. Mahaprabhu and all his associates, many of whom had left the mortal world more than fifty years earlier, personally appeared at the Keturi festival and danced at the height of Narottam's blessed kirtan. Thousands of attending devotees bore witness to this sacred event. The author of Bhakti Ratnakar incredulously asks, Who can describe the incomparable happiness of the devotees when in the midst of the kirtan the munificent Sri Chaitanya and his associates descended for the pleasure of his devotees? Like a flash of lightning in the middle of a mass of beautiful clouds, Sri Chaitanya himself appeared within the multitude of his followers. According to Prema Vilas, Mahaprabhu appeared with Nityananda Prabhu, Sri Advaita, Gadadhar, Sri Vas Thakur, Haridas Thakur, Svarup Damodar, Rupa Sanatan, and many others. Who indeed can imagine the heightened Baba as Janava saw her departed husband in the midst of the kirtan. Who can imagine the feeling of Advaita Acharya's sons when they saw their father singing and dancing as if he were a young man? How did Srivas Thakur's brothers stop themselves from crying when they saw Srivas himself dancing in front of Mahaprabhu just as they remembered him? In fact, they could not control themselves and were carried away by the ecstasy of being reunited with the Lord and his associates. By experiencing Vipralamba Bhava, intense separation, they were all to experience Samboga or divine union. As the devotees danced more and more, each one felt his or her body become soaked with tears as they completely lost themselves in Narottam's kirtan. For a time, Srinivas was able to control himself, but Narottam could not, and his kirtan reached irrepressible proportions. Some devotees shouted in Narottam's ear, Thank you, my master. Your devotional power has enabled us all to see Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in his unending spiritual dance with Advaita Acharya and the other eternal associates. Mahaprabhu had told Narottam in a dream the prior evening that he would come with his associates and ecstatically dance in his kirtan performance. So Narottam was waiting for this moment and would not abandon it so easily. In fact, the kirtan lasted many hours deep into the night. But it seemed endless, and for many it was, for they took the event 
with them and lived in its memory. Externally, it had come to a halt, and when it did, the devotees knew the phenomenon of love and separation as a first-hand experience. Just as Naratam's kirtan came to an end, Janavadevi began new festivities. She approached the newly installed deities and offered a special form of red powder, the kind that Radha and Krishna throw at each other during their holy festival. After the deities enjoyed the dye, Janavama instructed the devotees to take the many buckets of colored dye and commemorate the holy festival by throwing it at each other. Before the words had emanated from her lips, however, the devotees, thousands of them, were throwing the dye with great enthusiasm, enjoying remembrance of Radha and Krishna's fun-loving pastime. This took the devotees well into the night, and then they joyfully celebrated Mahaprabhu's appearance festival with specially composed songs about his divine birth and early pastimes. The next morning, Janava Ma and a team of experienced cooks trained by her, prepared breakfast for all of the devotees. Then, with a few assistants, she personally fed the devotees with her own hands. Only when everyone else had completed their meal did Janava herself sit down and enjoy the remnants. This was her humility. The festival lasted for three days, but for the attending Vaishnavas it was the experience of a lifetime. Many stayed in Keturi for several weeks, but in due course they all returned to their original villages. Only Ram Krishna Acharya and Ganga Narayan Chakravarti did not leave, because their love for Naratam would not allow them to bear being separated from him. Eventually, however, they too left under Naratam's instruction, and later, by their enthusiastic preaching, they succeeded in making the country of Manipur a Vaishnav kingdom. It is said that a great devotee named Bhagya Chandra also preached in Manipur on Naratam's behalf and solidified what Ramakrishna Acharya and Ganga Narayan Chakravarti had begun. For a number of complex reasons, the Keturi festival is considered one of the most important milestones in Vaishnav history. First of all, since the Goswami literature was stolen, Naratam did not initially have the asset of books with which to spread the message of the Goswamis, so he had to use a different medium. This he did through the Keturi festival, which eventually became an annual event and continued to be a source of inspiration even after the Goswami books were recovered. These festivals served a purpose similar to that of the famous ecumenical councils of Christendom. However, the lively singing and dancing and the complex Vedic theology underline a few obvious distinctions. By gathering Vaishnavas from many different lands in one place, Naratam was able to convey to them the conclusions of the Vrindavan Goswamis in an organized way and he was able to get the impressions of the Vaishnava pilgrims as well. Consequently, the results of these festivals established canonical doctrine and orthodox conclusions, or siddhanta, for future generations of Gaudiya Vaishnavas. This phenomenon is explained by sociologist and historian Hites Ranjan Sanyal. He says, quote, The festival of Ketori offered the Vaishnavas of Bengal the opportunity to know closely the Goswami system with modifications as envisaged by its adjustments to the tradition of Bhakti movement of Bengal with particular reference to Gore Paramyavad. The modified system provided the Vaishnavas of Bengal with what they lacked, namely a systematic formulation of their faith in the form of concrete Shastriya discourses. The Keturi congregation may have been conceived as a common platform on which the different groups of the Bhakti movement could meet each other for interaction and mutual understanding under the influence of the Goswami system. Unquote. It
It should be remembered that this was the very same concern that Janava Ma expressed to Jiva Goswami when she made her first pilgrimage to Vrindavan. Jiva Goswami reacted by sending the Goswami literature to eastern provinces with Srinivas, Naratam, and Shyamananda. The Ketori festival may be seen as an extension of this same plan, for at the festival the Goswami doctrines were conveyed and accepted with full enthusiasm. This was reflected in the installation of the deities, in the kirtan performance, as well as in every other major part of the celebration. For example, in relation to the installation ceremony, Hites Ranjan Sanyal elaborates, Quote, The installation of the Goranga Vishnu Priya image, along with the images of Radha Krishna, according to the rituals prescribed by the Goswamis, indicates a most interesting aspect of the attitude and efforts of Naratam. The devotees belonging to the Navadvip circle, who formed the core of the Bhakti movement in Gormandala, that is, in Bengal, came under the influence of Chaitanya at the pre-sanya stage of his life, and were devoted to the charming young man that he was. The early Bengali padas on Chaitanya, composed by the poets of Godamandala, refer to his beautiful young appearance and use the names Goranga, Gora, and Gorakishore, which are associated with it. The images of Chaitanya, which were conceived by the Gormandala devotees, represent Chaitanya dressed as a respectable young man, as a householder. The Goswamis of Vrindavan, however, who had seen Chaitanya in his sannyas life only, invariably refer to his yativesh, or ascetic's appearance, while adoring the Master in their texts. Naturally, the Goswami texts do not emphasize the existence of Vishnu Priya, Chaitanya's wife. By installing the Goranga Vishnu Priya image in Ketori, Naratam demonstrated the acceptance by the adherents of the Goswami system of Gaur Paramyavad, in other words, Chaitanya's selfhood as Krishna, who is the Param Tattva, or ultimate reality, according to the view of the Goswamis. The appearance of Vishnu Priya by the side of Chaitanya reinforces the identification of Chaitanya as Krishna, for Vishnu Priya is conceived of as the consort of Chaitanya in the same way as Radha is the Ladini Shakti, or energy of bliss, of Krishna. Unquote. If Naratam utilized the installation of deities to harmonize the existing Vaishnav theological conceptions of the time, his style of kirtan shows even greater sensitivity in this endeavor. He had studied kirtan under the Goswamis of Vrindavan, and in Vrindavan Krishna reigned supreme, but in Bengal adoration of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was emphasized. Naratam devised a kirtan method whereby the two Mahaprabhu and Krishna Kirtan can coalesce, since this is, after all, the ultimate message of the Gaudiya Sampradaya. Again, this has been eloquently explained by Hites Ranjan Sanyal. Quote, In the Ketori Mahotsav, Naratam introduced the Leela Kirtan designed by him. Rupa Goswami had classified Kirtan into three types, namely Nam Kirtan, Guna Kirtan and Leela Kirtan, all of which are songs on Krishna or about him. But in the Ketori festival, Naratam began the proceedings with the preface of Gorchandrika, that is, songs in adoration of Gorachandra. The Gorchandrika songs consisted of padas pertaining to the Gor Paramyavad composed by the poets of Goda Mandala. The practice of prefacing Krishna Lila with Gaur Chandrika represents the idea of identifying Chaitanya with Krishna, but with a particular emphasis on Krishna worship. Apparently, Naratam sought to reconcile the Goswami system with the tradition prevalent in Bengal. Unquote. In addition to these significant developments, Naratam, Srinivas, and their followers, like Ramchandra Kaviraj, 
were responsible for systematizing the techniques of Manjari sadhana, which were squarely based on the Goswami literature and the esoteric traditions passed down by Sri Chaitanya himself. Several well-known texts of the Padma Purana, as well as the writings of Kavi Karnapur, Raghunath Das Goswami, and especially Krishna Das Kaviraj, set the stage for Manjari introspection and established the philosophical underpinnings for Naratam's poetry, which elaborate the complexities of the Manjari form of meditation. Naratam's poetry and the Goswami literature he based it upon paved the way for later masterworks on the same subject, such as Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's Sri Krishna Bhavanamritam. Nonetheless, there were many who exploited Naratam's good name, such as the adherents of the deviant Sahajya movement, who attributed many of their practices to themes they had imbibed from Naratam's writings. Naratam himself, however, practiced strict celibacy and had nothing to do with heterodoxies of any kind. Naratam quickly became the most famous Vaishnav guru in all of Bengal. His profound poetry, which successfully elucidates all of Gaudiya philosophy, and his magnificent singing voice, which made him a proverbial legend in his own lifetime, had brought disciples to him from all over India. Moreover, his intense purity inspired people from all walks of life, from kings to Brahmins, to take full shelter of his feet. In late 16th century India, caste distinctions were very powerful considerations, and many who subscribed to the Brahminical orthodoxy did not look fondly upon Naratam, who was born in a Kayastra Shudra family, because he was initiating those of the Brahminical class. In fact, there were elaborate philosophical debates centering on this issue, and in several instances there were threats upon Naratam's life. This volatile controversy has continued into the current age. Even though Naratam and his intimate disciples convincingly quoted all of the pertinent scriptural sources and predecessor gurus to silence these caste-conscious agitators. In fact, Naratam's supporters were able to convert even those who had initially thought of committing murder. Nonetheless, the problem became so severe that at a subsequent Keturi festival, Birabhadra, Janavama's son, delivered a lecture on this very subject, and all who listened understood that caste should not be determined by birth, but by qualification and work. According to the scriptures and the Vaishnav tradition, these latter considerations were more important. More important still was love of God. The possessor of this, say the scriptures, transcends mundane classification such as the caste system. The fortunate persons who actually met Naratam and who had prolonged exposure to his contagious love did not doubt the truthfulness of this statement. There was a certain class of people, though, who heard of Naratam's activities only from afar and did all that was within their power to defame him. As these men inflamed each other's fears and insecurities, they formed a large group to obliterate Naratam's inappropriate, non-Brahminical leadership. To this end, they sought the assistance of the local king, who at that time was a pious man named Raj Narasinga. Raj Narasinga, who ruled the province of Pakapali, was consistently harassed by the orthodox Brahmin community in regard to Naratam. They said that Naratam was a low-born person and should therefore not have taken sannyas, nor should he have accepted as disciples those who were Brahmins by birth, such as Ganga Narayan Chakravarti and Ramachandra Kaviraj. They insisted that the king inflict a severe punishment on Naratam for his impertinence. 
the Raj sent a message to Naratam asking how a genuine sadhu such as he could possibly violate the injunctions of scripture by committing the alleged atrocities. Naratam responded by sending a letter which flatly stated that there was nothing in the scriptures properly interpreted to uphold the views of the caste-conscious Brahmins and that he was willing to attend a public debate to prove his point of view. Naratam assured the king that if his perspective on this subject was proven wrong, he would amend his ways. By the time the Raj finished reading Naratam's humble letter, he was convinced of the validity of Naratam's position. Nonetheless, he gathered together a group of his greatest scholars, including the famous Rupa Narayan, and they marched toward Ketori to debate with the Vaishnav saint. In the interim, however, Naratam's two dearmost Brahmin disciples, Ganga Narayan Chakravarti and Ramachandra Kaviraj, devised a clever ruse to show the real glory of their respect-worthy teacher. One of the Brahmin disciples disguised himself as a potter, the other as a seller of betel nuts. They quickly set up small shops in an area known as Kumarapur, just outside Ketorigram because this was on a roadway along which the king's men would have to pass. When the scholars came marching through, the two devotees called them over to buy their necessary supplies. This gave them the opportunity to engage in polite conversation, discussing various issues of the day. To the surprise of the scholars, however, these shopkeepers spoke in perfect Sanskrit, which only the most learned men were able to do. How is it, they considered, that simple shopkeepers in Naratam's town are such accomplished scholars? If simple working men are as sophisticated as this, what would the actual scholars be like, and what would Naratam be like? The king's men decided to see how knowledgeable these shopkeepers actually were and began to debate the issue of Naratam's status as a guru of Brahmins. With the greatest ease, Ganga Narayan and Ramachandra defeated the king's scholars. As the royal academics referred to scriptural quote after quote, Naratam's men showed them how they were taking the citations out of context or misinterpreting them altogether. Totally frustrated, they turned to the king and admitted their pathetic defeat. The king himself was eager to see how Rupa Narayan would deal with the two scholarly shopkeepers, but in due course he was also defeated. Finally, the two sadhus revealed who they actually were. The king then turned to his men and said, If you cannot defeat Naratam's disciples, how can you defeat Naratam? These painful words resounded in their ears. Eventually, they all became Naratam's disciples. Unlike Srinivas and Shyamananda, once Naratam left Vrindavan, he never returned. Rather, he spent his years in the vicinity of Ketorigram, cultivating devotees and writing his resplendent poetry. Govinda Kaviraj described Naratam as a great king of prema, or divine love, and Ramachandra as Naratam's minister. These two, Naratam and Ramachandra, spent much of their day studying and teaching the Bhagavat Purana and the literature of Rupa, Sanatan, and the other Goswamis. Since Naratam was the prince of a wealthy state, he was known as the Rajkumar in his youth, he had the opportunity to study with many great scholars of his day. Taking advantage of this, Naratam became eloquent and prolific and conveyed all of the tenets of Gaudiya Vaishnavism through the medium of poetic language. His most important work is the Pratana, 
a compendium of 33 Bengali songs. This is divided into 258 verses arranged in 55 sections. He succinctly deals with such subjects as prayer, self-criticism, mental training, spiritual happiness, the agony of the soul and separation from God, the superiority of Vaishnavism, the topmost aspirations, the guru-disciple relationship, residence in Vrindavan, the importance of asceticism, and the humility of a Vaishnav. In addition, 27 sections of Pratana focus on Manjari Sadhana, which is the esoteric form of Gaudiya practice, in which one visualizes oneself as a servant of Srimati Radharani. Since she is very dear to Krishna, this is the secret way to Krishna's heart. Also important is Naratam's Prema Bhakti Chandrika, a lengthy poem, 120 verses divided into nine sections that elucidates the full gamut of Gaudiya philosophy in seed-like form. This poem has to have been written after the first Keturi festival and the death of his dear friend Ramachandra Kaviraj, because Kaviraj's passing is mourned in one particular verse. Many of the same themes of the Pratana are dealt with in this masterpiece of Bengali poetry. Vishwanath Chakravarti, a later Vaishnav commentator, has written a Sanskrit explication of this work to the great satisfaction of the Vaishnav community. In addition to his two major works, Naratam wrote many shorter poems which were later included in important Vaishnav anthologies. In the 20th century, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada, was fond of singing Naratam's poetry and of quoting him in his lectures, which attests to the abiding value and relevance of Naratam's achievement. As revealed in Naratam's writings, he survived Jiva Goswami and his best friend Ramachandra Kaviraj. In the same way that he had felt separated from Mahaprabhu and Radha Krishna, so he also felt intense separation from his exalted contemporaries. Naratam's biographers always describe him as being in a mixed state of bliss and divine lamentation, which according to Vaishnav doctrine evokes the highest spiritual sentiments. Writers have described Naratam's sensitive state by saying that he perpetually bedewed the ground beneath his feet with the streams of tenderness that gushed from his pious eyes. With an unprecedented passion, he yearned for God and for God's associates. Finally, Naratam could not tolerate the intensity of love and separation and decided to rejoin the Lord in the spiritual world. At the home of Ganga Narayan Chakravarti, in Morshidabad, he thus went into trance, totally absorbed in Radha Krishna Lila. This lasted for several days, convincing many that Naratam was planning to leave the world. However, several of his die-hard opponents from the Brahminical orthodoxy ridiculed him at this crucial moment. Just see, they shouted, he spent his life initiating Brahmins, but he was never anything more than a low-born Shudra and now he will die as one. Ganga Narayan Chakravarti could not tolerate their blasphemous words and prayed to his guru, Please come back, show them that they are fools. At that very moment, Naratam's body began to glow and a golden Brahmin thread mystically appeared on his body. Observing this miracle, the caste-conscious Brahmins immediately confessed their mistake and surrendered at Naratam's feet, begging forgiveness. There is a slightly different version of this in Naratam Vilas. Naratam had his disciples bring him to Budhari and then to Gambila to bathe in the Ganges. 
At that time, he was besieged by a raging fever and expected to die. He immediately ordered his disciples to stack wood in preparation for his cremation. This naturally made his disciples uneasy. Still, they complied with their guru's wishes. Naratam then sat silently for three days and finally left his body before many witnesses, disciples, and others as well. After the soul passed from his body, the disciples placed him on the decorated seat of firewood. Just then, the critical Brahmins started to shout blasphemous obscenities at Ganga Narayan and at Naratam's other faithful followers. Ganga Narayan could not tolerate their harsh words, and so he prayed to Naratam to please come back and to show his mercy to these misguided Brahmins. At that very moment, Naratam's eyes opened and he said, Radha Krishna Chaitanya. Moreover, his body radiated with the intensity of the sun, forcing the awe-inspired Brahmins to change their point of view. Witnessing this resurrection-like incident, everyone surrendered to Naratam's lotus feet. He embraced them all, bestowing upon them the jewels of bhakti. He ordered them to study the bhakti scriptures with Ganga Narayan Chakravarti, and then he left that area, wanting to meditate in solitude. For the next several months, he exhibited ecstatic symptoms and repeatedly bemoaned the separation of Sri Sri, Radha and Krishna. Some time later, Naratam actually prepared to leave the earthly realm. He requested Ganga Narayan and other intimate followers to accompany him to the Ganges a second time. When they arrived, Naratam offered obeisances to that holy river and entered her waters. He gestured that his disciples should join him, asking them to fill their hands with water and pour it over his body. As they complied with his wishes, they watched as his bodily limbs turned to milk and mixed with the waters of the Ganges. Their natural impulse was to stop, lest their guru totally disappear into the waves of the river. But they had their order, and they dutifully carried it out, as their own tears also merged with the Ganges. When the, when the miraculous ritual came to an end, Ganga Narayan filled a jug with the milk that was once Naratam's body. This milk was taken to a holy place near Ganga Narayan's home in Jia Ganja, Morshidabad district, West Bengal, where Naratam's tomb, Samadhi, was soon erected. This tomb came to be known as Dugda Samadhi, or the tomb of milk, and it is an important pilgrimage site for all Godia Vaishnavs. And now we present some of the songs of Nartam Das Thakur. These extracts should give the listener an overview of Srinivas and Naratam's unique spiritual perspective. Anyone interested in obtaining tapes or CDs of Srila Prabhupada singing these songs is advised to contact the BBT archives for its catalog. Ishta Deve Vigyapti, Prayer to One's Beloved Lord. O Lord Hari, I have spent my life uselessly, having obtained a human birth and having not worshipped Radha and Krishna, I have knowingly drunk poison. The treasure of divine love in Goloka Vrindavan has descended as the congregational chanting of Lord Hari's holy names. Why did my attraction for that chanting never come about? Day and night my heart burns from the fire of the poison of worldliness, and I have not taken the means to relieve it. Lord Krishna, who is the son of the king of Braja, became the son of Sachi, Lord Chaitanya, and Balaram became Nitai. The holy name delivered all those souls who are lowly and wretched. The two sinners, Jagai and Madhai, are evidence of this. O Lord Krishna, son of Nanda, accompanied by the daughter of Vishabhanu, please be merciful to me now. Naratam Das says, O Lord, 
please do not push me away from your reddish lotus feet, for who is my beloved except you? Saki Vrinde Vigyapti, Prayer to the Sakis The divine couple, Sri Radha and Krishna, are my life and soul. In life or death I have no other refuge but them. In a forest of small kadamba trees on the bank of the Yamuna, I will seat the divine couple on a throne made of brilliant jewels. I will anoint their dark and fair forms with sandalwood paste, scented with choya, and I will fan them with a chumra whisk. Oh, when will I behold their moonlike faces? After stringing together garlands of malati flowers, I will place them around their necks, and I will offer tambula scented with camphor to their lotus mouths. With the permission of all the sakis headed by Lalita and Vishaka, I will serve the lotus feet of Radha and Krishna. Naratam Das, the servant of the servant of Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, longs for this service to the divine couple. Saparshita Bhagavad Viraha Janata Vilapa Lamentation due to separation from the Lord and His associates. He who brought the treasure of divine love and who is filled with compassion and mercy, where has such a personality as Srinivas Acharya gone? Where are my Svarup Damada and Rupa Goswami? Where is Sanatan? Where is Raghunath Das, the savior of the fallen? Where are my Raghunath Bhatta and Gopal Bhatta? And where is Krishna Das Kaviraj? Where did Lord Goranga, the great dancer, suddenly go? I will smash my head against the rock and enter into the fire. Where will I find Lord Goranga, the reservoir of all wonderful qualities? Being unable to obtain the association of Lord Goranga, accompanied by all of these devotees in whose association he performed his pastimes, Naratam Das simply weeps. Sri Rupa Manjari Pada, the feet of Sri Rupa Manjari. The lotus feet of Sri Rupa Manjari are my treasure, my devotional service, and my object of worship. They give my life meaning, and they are the life of my life. They are the perfection of rasa, and they are perfection worthy of attainment. They are the very law of the Vedic scriptures for me. They are the meaning of all my fasts and penances and my silent utterings of my mantras. They are the basis of religion and activities. By the purifying process of favorable devotional service, one will attain perfection and with these two eyes be able to see. His transcendental form is shining like moonlight in my heart, and my heart therefore shines and reciprocates. In other words, the ordinary moon lights up the night, and its shine illuminates other objects. But the moon of the effulgence of the form of Sri Rupa Manjari shines into the heart and makes the heart also shine back to the spiritual sky. This moon shines not only in the nighttime, but day and night. Your absence from my vision is like a dose of strong poison, and I will suffer to the end of my life. Naratam Das Thakur says, Please give me your mercy and the shade of your lotus feet. Vaishnave Vigyapti, Prayer to the Vaishnav O Vaishnav Goswami, please be merciful to me now. There is no one except you who can purify the fallen souls. Where does anyone find such a merciful personality 
by whose mere audience all sins go far away. After bathing in the waters of the sacred Ganges many times, one becomes purified, but just by the sight of you, the fallen souls are purified. This is your great power. The holy name delivers one who has committed an offense to Lord Hari, but if one commits an offense to you, there is no means of deliverance. Your heart is always the resting place of Lord Govinda, and Lord Govinda says, the Vaishnavas are in my heart. I desire the dust of your holy feet in every birth I may take. Please consider Naratam yours and be kind upon him. This production about the lives of Srinivas Acharya and Naratam Das Thakur has been based on the book Lives of the Vaishnav Saints by Stephen Rosen, also known as Satyaraj Das. The production has been directed and narrated by Amala Bhakta Das, the music selected and mixed by Mahatma Das, and the project has been dedicated to His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, founder Acharya, of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. The material herein has been copyrighted, and all rights to the text are reserved by Stephen Rosen, to the song translations by BBT International, and to the performance by Amala Bhakta Das. This recording may not be duplicated by any means without the express permission of the producers. Thank you for listening. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare